Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sometimes when I rise in the House, I say that'll be a tough act to follow. However, uh, that is not the case today, uh, Madam Speaker. I am speaking on Bill C-57. This implements the agreement that this government negotiated uh, with Ukraine. And, and as has been the case throughout this debate, I will make some general reflections on Conservative support for Ukraine. But it's important to underline that these are two distinct issues. There is the question of whether and how we should support Ukraine, and Conservatives are firmly in favour of supporting Ukraine. And then there's the question of the particular provisions of Bill C-57. Now, Bill C-57 isn't a, a kind of in a vacuum endorsement of a relationship with a particular country. Bill C-57 is implementing a specific trade deal with specific provisions. And members opposite have said virtually nothing during this entire debate about the actual provisions in this legislation, about what this deal would actually commit Canada to and Ukraine to. And, and, and I'll read the section, which is a matter of, of contention, directly from the agreement. Consistent with Article 13.24, the parties shall cooperate bilaterally and international forums to address matters of mutual interest as appropriate to, and then a list, and I'll jump to item H, promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. Again, that's right in the text of the agreement. Promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. So when, when in speech after speech, members of the government say, Carbon price? Where? Where? Well, it's right, it's right in the deal that they signed, Madam Speaker. So, so, so let's not pretend that it's not in there. Because any Canadian could go online and find the agreement and find this provision. Promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. Now, I have a sense that Liberals don't actually take their word or their commitments very seriously. And we've seen that over the last eight no years. Way. So I think the way, the way they approach this deal is is it's, it's just words. It's, it's only words. So, so, why, so why do they care so much? Well, Conservatives take our words seriously. We take documents we sign on to seriously. And, and we want to be, we aspire to be people of integrity. So when we see in a trade agreement something that we profoundly disagree with, well, that's, that's going to impact how we vote on that agreement. When we're, when we're committed to a, a national campaign to axe the tax, when, when one of our key priorities is axing the tax, when we've assured Canadians that we will ax the tax, it would be a little bit of a problem if we just shrugged off a line in an international agreement which would oblige us to promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. And that, 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 that seems fairly basic, that we would note what's in the agreement, that we would evaluate the agreement on the basis of what's in it, and that we would make a decision accordingly while on, on the separate point of support for Ukraine being very clear that the Conservative Party strongly supports Ukraine. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, it, is, it is true that the government of Ukraine uh, takes a different view of this agreement than we do. But there are innumerable issues on which this government has previously taken a different view from the government of Ukraine, including in the midst of the war, in which they have ignored the pr expressed priorities of the government of Ukraine. In fact, as, as I'll get to, there's one instance in which the government of Ukraine was so upset about a decision of this Prime Minister that the Canadian ambassador was summoned. Now that, that is an unprecedented step. Certainly, I think it's the first time in the history of, of Canada-Ukraine relations that the Canadian ambassador to Ukraine was summoned as a result of, of displeasure about the way that that uh, the government of Ukraine believed this government was undermining a global united front in support of Ukraine. And, and, and they want us to forget about that by saying, well, 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 but, but this is the most important issue. Now, now I, I think it's fairly obvious, listening to what the Ukrainian government says, that although we do have a, a disagreement over uh, uh, certain provisions of this, of this trade agreement, that the most important thing to the government of Ukraine is not the free trade deal, it's the provisions that we need to undertake to support Ukraine in their victory. Conservatives have been clear and consistent in our support for Ukraine. And let's, let's underline the things that we have done, the things we have advocated for in the process. Of course, uh, a, a, the, the invasion of Ukraine by the Putin regime did not start in 
February of 2022. It began back in 2014 when conservatives were in power. And, and Prime Minister Stephen Harper led the G7 in isolating Russia and applying critical sanctions. Canadian leadership under Prime Minister Stephen Harper was recognized and was critical to driving a consensus. As Prime Minister Harper said, whether it takes five months or 50 years, we will defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And that is a commitment that Conservatives carry forward. As soon as Liberals took office, they started backing away from that commitment. Mad Madam Speaker, I recall uh, in, in this place challenging Foreign Affairs Minister Stéphane Dion, who made the decision to cancel the sharing of satellite imagery associated with Raiderstadt. Remember, Ukraine was still then at war with Russia. And Canada, under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, was sharing satellite images with Ukraine that were useful as part of the war effort. And in an effort to appease the Putin regime, Liberal Minister Stephen Dion cancelled the sharing of those satellite images. Where was the member for Kingston and the Islands right when that happened? Right he, was, he was more silent then than he is now. <laughs> Frankly, I'd, I'd prefer a more silent member compared to what we, what we get now, Madam Speaker. But, but, but the, point, the point is, all of these members who are now eagerly wrapping themselves in blue and yellow had nothing to say when Liberal Foreign Affairs Minister Stefan Dion cancelled radar stat uh, uh, image sharing. Now, we consistently advocated for tough sanctions against the Putin regime. We were standing up in this House for stronger measures prior to the further invasion uh, of two Februarys ago. We were saying that preemptively, if this government was ready to apply tougher sanctions, it could be a force of deterrence against the Putin regime. We were calling for the sharing of lethal weapons with our Ukrainian allies prior to the invasion so they could get ready. And you don't have to take my word for it, Madam Speaker. You can find the quotations of members opposite speaking against that. The member for Edmonton Strathcona, the NDP foreign affairs critic, explicitly opposed the sharing of lethal weapons prior to the further invasion of February 2022. We were calling for tougher sanctions earlier, and Liberals and New Democrats were opposing those measures. That is the reality. It is on the record. Other, other initiatives. We put forward a motion in this House after the, the further invasion started to allow visa-free travel for Ukrainians fleeing the war. Actually, at that time, it was Conservatives, Bloc, and NDP came together, adopted that motion calling for visa-free travel, uh, but the, the uh, government refused to implement that proposal. So we were calling for more generous uh, immigration measures. Of course, one key area where we have led on this side of the House is energy policy. Madam Speaker, we have long recognized that Canada has a special vocation in the democratic world. Many of our democratic allies and partners, both in Europe and in the Asia-Pacific, are geographically small, densely populated nations that need to import energy resources. Canada is relatively unique in the democratic world as a geographically vast, more sparsely populated nation with an abundance of natural resources. We need to develop and export those resources. Not, not merely as a matter of our own economic interests, but, but as a matter of providing the democratic world with the energy security that they require. And we have made this case consistently, Madam Speaker. We have, we have said that Canada has a role and a responsibility, again, not only to create jobs and opportunity for Canadian workers, but in this new Cold War reality to provide our allies and partners with the energy security that they need so that they can stand with us for the long haul defending freedom and justice. Here, here. And when our European partners, when our Asia-Pacific partners are reliant on energy from dictatorships, from hostile regimes that don't share our values, that has the effect of weakening our collective resolve and it, it pours money into the coffers of hostile anti-democratic regimes. Mm -hmm. It is a security imperative for Canada to develop our energy resources. But this government has said there isn't a business case for that. Of course, there is a business case, but there's not, in their mind, an ideological case. And they're far more concerned about uh, according with their ideology than they are with the realities of the business case. Madam Speaker, uh, what this government has done since the further invasion of Ukraine by Russia 
is rather than supporting the rapid increase in development of Canada's energy resources to, to fuel uh, the, the efforts of our, of our European allies to, to find energy security, rather than, than developing Canadian resources, they granted a sanctions waiver to allow the export of turbines from Canada to facilitate the export of Russian gas to Europe. Isn't that incredible? This government, when they could have been creating jobs and opportunity for Canadian workers and securing energy security, they chose to grant a waiver to allow turbines from Canada to facilitate the export of Russian gas to Europe. They were doing more to export Russian gas to Europe and, and, and increase that dependency rather than export Canadian gas. And this was the instance in which the Ukrainian government, President Zelensky, spoke out against what this government was doing. He spoke out clearly and decisively. He summoned the Canadian ambassador to Ukraine. And this was, this was particularly important for Ukraine, not, not only because of the, the facts of the case, but also because of how Canada granting exceptions to sanctions was seen as creating a dangerous precedent. As we heard at the Foreign Affairs Committee, when, 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 you, when, you tr when you say you're imposing sanctions, and then you turn those sanctions into Swiss cheese by granting convenient exceptions. When every country says, well, we're going to grant sanctions, but we're going to have this exception, and this exception, and this exception, very quickly, you don't have a sanctions regime worth the name. So this, this government was undermining that sanctions unity and undermining the opportunity uh, to, to fuel European energy security. And conservatives fought back. Conservatives called for special hearings at the Foreign Affairs Committee. We gathered in the summer, we summoned witnesses, we pressed the government hard, we pursued this matter in the face of liberal filibusters through the fall until we were finally able to force them to reverse course. And conservatives are very proud of that accomplishment, holding this government's feet to the fire. At every instance where they have been weak on supporting Ukraine, whether it has been canceling uh, uh, technology, satellite, radar stat tech, image sharing, whether it has been uh, failing to, to apply the appropriate sanctions, whether it's been their rejection of our, of our uh, proposals on visa-free travel, whether it's been our championing of energy security. We have always been pushing the government to do far more to support our friends and allies in Ukraine. And this, Madam Speaker, has continued to the present day. When C-57 came before committee, Notwithstanding our concerns about the bill, we did try to improve it. Conservatives put forward many amendments that would add specific provisions to C-57 that deal with getting weapons to Ukraine. And Ukraine has been very clear about this. What Ukraine needs to win this war is weapons. And many have said, rightly so, that we must be with Ukraine for as long as possible. I agree with that. We must be with Ukraine for as long as possible. And we must also help Ukraine win victory as quickly as possible. <clears throat> because when liberals say we'll be there for as long as possible, but, but they take as long as possible to actually deliver the support that's required, well, that's not doing much good, is it? No. So let's, win, let's be there for as long as possible, and let's deliver the vitally necessary aid as quickly as possible. Let's do both, as long as possible and as quickly as possible so that Ukraine can secure a, a clear victory faster. And what we've seen throughout the course of this war is that delays in delivering essential weaponry have allowed the Russian army to further entrench their defensive positions. If only, if only the Western world had stepped up to quickly deliver vitally important weapons and defense systems right out of the gate, then Ukraine would be in a much better position. Of course, Ukrainians have fought heroically but we must have their back, not only with words, but with deeds. Not only with photo ops, not only with announcements, but by actually delivering Ukraine the weapons that they require. So I put forward amendments to this bill at committee that would have done a number of things. The amendments that, that, that I put forward on behalf of the Conservative Caucus would have established a legal requirement for the federal government to create a long-term plan to increase defense production, with a particular emphasis on defense supplies required by the armed forces of Ukraine and the Canadian Armed Forces. The amendments would have established a legal requirement for the Minister of National Defense to periodically review Canada's inventory of military equipment and offer to donate to Ukraine any military equipment that is surplus or is no longer useful to Canada. 
The amendments would have added Ukraine to the list of open policy countries eligible for expedited review of arms exports, significantly reducing the time for review required before arms can be shipped to Ukraine. And finally, I would have, so, through this, these amendments, we sought to require EDC and BDC to support investments aimed at developing Ukraine's domestic munitions manufacturing industries. If Conservatives were in government, we would have negotiated a better free trade deal that would have included provisions like this to actually get Ukraine the weapons they need, instead of putting the emphasis on, quote, carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. Sadly, this government's idea, whether, whether it's, it's, uh, it's in, in the issue of blocking Canadian energy development, or putting uh, divisive carbon tax measures into the, into, into the agreement. We see how li liberal, radical ideology seeps into everything they do and gets in the way of doing the right thing to support Ukraine. Conservatives would have zeroed in on the essential needs of Ukraine. And, and Madam Speaker, if we had been in government, if we were in government, we would have negotiated and proposed a better deal that would have been good for Canada and good for Ukraine and focused on uh, delivering weapons. But sadly, all of the amendments that I put forward at committee were opposed and blocked by the NDP Liberal Coalition. They opposed our efforts to get these weapons to Ukraine through the amendments that we proposed. What a shame. But we have persisted. We have persisted. Uh, this past Friday, in fact, Conser the Conservative leader announced a proposal calling on the government to transfer rockets to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, these are rockets that the government has slated for, uh, for disposing of. And, and, and we think uh, a better way to dispose of them is to, is to give them to Ukraine so they can drop them off on the Russians. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, in, in fact, our, our analyses show that, that giving these uh, weapons to Ukraine would be less costly than disposing of them here. So, so what has stopped this government from, uh, from doing this already? It's, it's hard to explain. But we can see a myriad of announcements made by this government on Ukraine and no action. It's A for announcement, F for follow through. They, they, they talk about solidarity, but they fail to deliver. And, and this is just consistent with the government's approach across the board is that they want to use this issue to create division in this House, but, but they have failed to actually deliver on the weapons. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, if I can uh, briefly say a, a couple additional things about support for Ukraine. It is so important that all of us come together to support Ukraine. And when I have conversations with people about this, some, some are, are asking questions. They say, well, 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 isn't it complicated? Is it a complicated situation? Madam Speaker, it's not a complicated situation. It is, it, is, it is an entirely uncomplicated situation, the most uncomplicated situation you could imagine. The government of Russia chose to invade another sovereign state in order to try to steal its territory. It did so after having signed an agreement, the Budapest Memorandum, that committed it to recognizing Ukraine's territorial integrity. It signed a binding international agreement recognizing Ukraine's territorial integrity. It broke that agreement by invading uh, in order to steal territory. And, and, and this, this is, is, is clearly the kind of precedent we cannot allow. And if we allow it, it will create a more dangerous world. Ukraine can win. It will win with the support of the West, the consistent, persistent, steadfast support of the West. We must be there to back Ukrainians up. And that doesn't just mean making announcements. It's, it means delivering the weapons. Because to win a war, you need weapons, not announcements. And so I challenge this government to put actions behind their words. And, and, and this is not just about territory. Because the choice between living in Ukraine and living in Russia is not just a matter of what state you're in. It is a choice about the kind of political system you have. Ukraine is a free society where people can choose who they associate with, what they say, what they believe, how they worship. In Russia, every person is, is completely beholden and dependent on the state. In Russian-occupied Ukraine, we are seeing the mass stealing of children, a brutal, brutal story of the systematic abduction of Ukrainian children 
forced into propaganda uh, programs, and in many cases used as soldiers against, against Ukraine. The choice is not just about territory or about what state you're in. It's about the kind of system you live in. And this is why Ukrainians are prepared to fight and die for their freedom for as long as it takes. Let's be with them as long as it takes, but let's help them win as quickly as possible with weapons. Thank you. Yeah.